Okay. So welcome again to Zoom into Archaeology. I'm so thrilled this week to welcome UWF Associate Professor Dr. Rémy Goujon. He, um, we kind of wrangled him into giving us a presentation today because he does a, he has a lot of interesting research on topics um, locally and elsewhere. So thank you, Rémy, so much for being here. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, today I'm going to cheat a bit and talk about everybody else's research. <laughs> um, let me get my screen pulled up for everyone to see. <clears throat> okay. Again, my name is Rémy Goujon, and I'm an anthropological archaeologist at the University of West Florida. Um, my area of interest is the pre-Columbian peoples of the Southeast. Um, among the, the many different types of classes I teach, my well, probably favorite one is on the history of anthropological theory. And you're probably thinking, why on earth is Dr. Goujon going to be talking about theory in an overview of archaeology? Well, that's because theories are behind every interpretation of the archaeological record you've ever seen. Theories are the way we order our facts. If you give 10 people the same set of observations and they have 10 different theoretical perspectives, you're likely going to get 10 different interpretation of those facts. I'm going to talk about theory because I want you to understand that it is changes in our theories and perspectives that drive new interpretations of the past, much more than any headline grabbing discovery from some kind of excavation. So back to my history of theory class. One of the reasons I like this class so much is because it allows me to reconsider everything I think I know about anthropology. Um, for me, one of the most interesting points in the history of Western ideas are those centuries before there was even a discipline of anthropology. And I'm talking about the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, the Enlightenment and the lead up to the Industrial Revolution. It was during this period that we see a lot of ideas that are today taken as received wisdom um, in all kinds of subjects like economics and politics and social policies, and yes, anthropology. One of the most persistent has been the idea that humankind has progressed from small egalitarian bands into highly complex, large-scale, hierarchical civilizations. Implied in this notion of progress are ideas about um, levels of inequality, innovation and intelligence, political and social complexity, and economics. But know this, the idea that humankind has progressed or evolved in some kind of single upward direction is a just-so story. What if we viewed the history of the Southeast through different theoretical lenses? So, what is the Southeast? Generally speaking, when an archaeologist refers to the Southeast, they're talking about an area that covers more than what we presently consider the, the kind of cultural Southeast. This is a region with a lot of ecological diversity and geological variability. What makes it trickier to define is that, depending on the cultural period we're talking about, um, the borders fluctuate a bit. The southeast generally peters out as we move west of the Mississippi River and into the plains, but traits associated with pre-Columbian southeast persist deep into the Missouri and Arkansas and Red River basins. Um, southeastern cultural traits sometimes spill over north of the Ohio River Valley, um, but on the coast of the Mid-Atlantic and even parts of present-day North Carolina um, only occasionally seem to look like the rest of the South. And then the southernmost tip of Florida has always been its own weird little place. A word about archaeology, though. A moment ago, I used the term cultural period. These are blocks of time identified by archaeologists to help us break up that long 14 and a half thousand year history into meaningful chunks. In a way, these periods are a form of typology. And we create typologies when we group things together in such a way that the things in one pile more closely or more have more things in common with each other 
than they do with things in another pile. So think about how you sort cutlery in your kitchen drawer um, or how you put clothes in a chest of drawers. You do this with an order that makes sense to you. Archaeologists create seemingly endless typologies to sort out artifacts and sites and time and even theories into categories that are meaningful to other archaeologists and give us a starting point um, when we want to talk to one another. But don't mistake types for reality. There's little chance that a trip in a time machine um, would reveal that Native American people view themselves in the same way and in the same categories that archaeologists do. Cultural periods then are spans of time when archaeologists believe that the life ways of those living within each period have more in common with each other than they do with those who came before or after them. These are typically defined by changes in technology or subsistence, you know, how people make a living. Um, but it also includes assumptions about their socio-political systems. The major cultural periods of the Southeast um, are here, Paleo-Indian, Archaic, Woodland, Mississippi, um, followed by a kind of less clearly definable contact or early historic period. The dates here are as fuzzy as the geological or geographical boundaries that I showed you a moment ago. Depending on where you are in the Southeast, these periods may have terminated earlier or persisted longer than the estimates that you can see on your screen. So much of the ink being spilled about Paleo-Indians is focused on the topics of the timing of their arrival from Northeast Asia and secondarily about their life ways. The timing issue is a big argument that's been going on for as long as there have been Euro-Americans pondering the origins of indigenous people. New sites and discoveries have a tendency to be sensationalized before they can be properly vetted. And as my colleague, Dr. Shane Miller at Mississippi State puts it, we need a dragnet approach that constructs a narrative that covers the most archeological data. So recent claims of a 33,000 year old site in Mexico, or even more ridiculously, a 130,000 year old site in San Diego are problematic in and of themselves, and even more so when you try to situate them in the context of what else we already know um, about the ages of uncontested sites in North and South America. One solid anchor point we have uh, is provided by Dr. Jessie Halligan at Florida State University. Her team has been working at the Page Ladson site for a number of years. This is on the Osceola River in northern Florida. This is a very unique site um, being underwater as it is. And it's unusual even for submerged sites. When archaeologists, or when southeastern archaeologists, talk about submerged terrestrial sites, we're usually talking about pre-Columbian coastal sites that have become inundated with changes in sea level. Uh, the Page Ladson site is situated around a low point in a riverbed that would have continued to hold water um, even during those driest periods during the transition from the Ice Age or the Pleistocene to the Holocene that we are living in today. As Dr. Halligan reminds us, this was a terrestrial site visited and used by people who may not have interacted with the coast at all. They have to do further studies to demonstrate that. This is a site that's deep in the interior during the late Pleistocene. Um, she's got an incredible amount of data from this site and, and a really interesting array of material culture, including tons of mastodon dung and stone tools and the debris from the manufacture of stone tools and a lot of environmental data that allows her to make re environmental reconstructions of the site and date it. This site dates to or was occupied slam dunk 14,550 years ago, or about 12,600 uh, BCE. So any models that we develop about the entry of people into the new world from Asia has to take into account that people are already in North Florida 14,550 years ago. Alongside this timing issue is a need for interpretations of what Paleo-Indian life was like 
This is made all the more challenging um, given the types of materials that are preserved on sites this old or the lack of materials that are preserved on sites this old. Typically, these sites contain stone tools and related debris, um, ivory or bone objects, and sometimes minerals like ochre, um, but very little else. So if we're operating under this theory, uh, this old enlightenment idea of, of developmental progress through time, um, we typically assume that these were small bands of closely related individuals, you know, extended families, who were pursuing megafauna across unfamiliar landscapes, kind of endlessly wandering and occasionally finding sources of really high quality lithic material, um, and, and sort of tethering themselves to other wandering groups in order to secure mates for their kids. Um, life really was, as, as Hobbes predicted, brutish, nasty, short, and solitary. In the mid 20th century, with the advent of hunter-gatherer studies in anthropology, past hunter-gatherer study, past hunter-gatherer societies got a bit of a makeover. Um, anthropologists sort of failed to see at first that as a discipline, we have never had an opportunity to study foragers or hunter-gatherers who haven't already been affected by contacts with nation states. But regardless, the models that we developed around hunter-gatherer societies suggested that they were the original affluent society. Um, they had short working hours, you know, if you weren't a mom raising kids. They had plenty to eat, and they had lots of leisure time. And this image was projected back onto humanity's pre-agricultural ancestors, but curiously not often applied to Paleo-Indian populations who inhabit the models of our late Pleistocene Southeast. Just very recently, within the past few days, there's been an announcement of the discovery of yet another set of preserved human footprints at White Sands National Park in New Mexico. And this is starting to make the rounds on social media. These remarkable prints date to about 10,000 years ago when two individuals, likely a woman and a child, walked out and then back again along the shore of the former Lake Otero. The adult probably carried the child across um, the landscape. And we can see this because the kid's footprints disappear and then reappear. And the way her feet shift suggests that she's shifting the kid from one hip to the other. Really fascinating stuff. Um, but look at this illustration that's being passed around with the news. Instead of a woman and child moving confidently through a landscape they're well familiar with, um, passing places where food or medicine or raw materials might be collected, you know, on their way to visit another group of people in the, in the region, she is instead carrying her naked child through a thunderstorm, nervously looking out for dire wolves that are pursuing her while a couple of giant mastodons loom in the background. What the heck? The next cultural period is called the Archaic. Now this is a period traditionally interpreted as a time of settling into the landscape, uh, traveling within territories to access seasonally available foods and to tap into preferred lithic sources. Due to similar poor preservation issues, a lot of our focus has been on lithic tools. So different lithic analyses have teased out the ingenuity of nappers who have designed new tool forms and hafting styles. And then the appearance of groundstone tools like mortars and pestles, nutting stones, axes, wedges, mauls, and things like this, this has been interpreted as evidence of people adapting to hickory and oak forests, basically taking advantage of a wide array of new resources. A mortuary pond site called Windover over near Titusville, Georgia, uh, Florida, has revealed other sort of tantalizing items that we almost never see preserved, including things like handwoven cloth, basketry, um, and gourd containers. Um, undoubtedly, archaic people twisted cordage to make into nets and lines for snares and for fishing and their baskets held food and household goods. Woven mats probably lined the floors and the walls of their houses. And for the most part, our interpretations of the archaic um, 
have really painted a picture of quotidian, simple lives, not terribly complex. The transition from the archaic to the woodland period in these older interpretations was indicated by changes in technology, um, primarily the, the refinement and expanded use of ceramics, and then an increasing reliance on horticulture. So again, that, that persistent idea of progress. Except we found a really complex site that's forced us to rethink all of these assumptions. Poverty Point in northern, Florida, uh, northern Louisiana is as unique a place as you can find in the southeast. The six concentric half, uh, six concentric half rings of earth span nearly three quarters of a mile across and form a plaza in the center that's hundreds of feet wide. And among the six different mounds directly associated with this site, the big one in the back, Mound A, is nearly 70 feet tall. Remarkably, in spite of there not being a lithic source within about 700 square miles of the place, excavations there have revealed this incredible range of lithic objects and debris from a really staggering range of sources, of different rock sources. The people who constructed this elaborate site were engaged in far-flung exchanges and hosted um, uh, groups of people coming in from hundreds of miles away and from every direction. The problem with Poverty Point at first was that no one could believe that it dated to the archaic period. The first radiocarbon dates that came in were almost thrown out because everybody thought that they were obviously um, you know, some, some kind of problem with contamination or old wood or something like this. Our tired old model of progress would suggest that no foraging or hunter-gatherer society without agriculture could support um, or raise enough surplus food to sustain the numbers of people it would take to build such a huge place. You know, the alternative model was, well, maybe they just took millennia, a basket full at a time to create this gigantic site. Dr. John Gibson has argued that the natural abundance of this area would have made feeding any influx of people possible. Fish remains abound, as do deer, along with different sorts of nut meats like acorns, and they have plenty of different wild seeds and squashes, uh, persimmons, you name it. As for the question of how long the site uh, took to create, geoarchaeological studies performed by Dr. T.R. Kidder and Dr. Sarah Sherwood estimate that Mound A, the big one, uh, was likely built in as short as 30 to 90 days by perhaps a thousand workers with many others supporting them. Complexity was evidently baked in to the earliest inhabitants of the Southeast. Research on the woodland period was long focused on topics like ceramic technology, how it became more refined and efficient, um, and the Eastern agricultural complex, which actually dates back to the archaic period. The story was one of people increasingly settling permanently or nearly so in river valleys and in areas where they could um, encourage weedy plants and experiment with horticulture um, while also beginning to play with a new crop that had come into the Southeast being corn. Um, and they could also continue their usual hunting and gathering activities. Villages sprung up, more permanent villages, sometimes palisaded, which suggested that uh, there were sometimes tensions between groups of people. And then large and small earthen mounds dotted the landscape, some of which held burials with elaborate pottery or copper covered objects. Um, effigy mounds were created along the northern edge of the southeast at this time, and evidence of really long distance exchange of things like sheets of mica or copper and even grizzly bear teeth suggested that Native American religions and economies were becoming more advanced and more complex. Except that they were always complex. As Poverty Point and a half dozen other elaborate sites just like it demonstrate, ritual activity, long distance exchanges, and the coordination of labor for monumental architecture have long been a part of the Southeastern cultural toolkit. The middle, uh, the, the middle woodland 
spans from about 300 BCE to 600 CE and is marked across the Southeast by some very distinct ceremonial traditions. When anthropologists talk about ritual, uh, what we're referring to are behaviors that a practitioner must perform in a very prescribed way. Archaeologists find traces of these when the ritual performance leaves a mark on the landscape or when rituals incorporate material goods in a way that is different from everyday objects. During the Middle Woodland, ceremonialism centered on a few key material elements, including uses of exotic goods like animal parts, um, copper and mica objects, um, and exchanges of pottery, and rituals centered on burial mounds. Early research on woodland ceremonialism traced the exchanges of materials and presumably ideas between far-flung centers in a Hopewell interaction sphere. This Hopewell interaction sphere flourished in the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys, uh, but likely never penetrated the core of the Southeast. Instead, another tradition we call Swift Creek developed perhaps as early as 50 CE and persisted into the late woodland, uh, maybe as late as 950 CE. Dr. Neil Wallace at the Florida Museum is one of a handful of archeologists redefining woodland ceremonialism by examining changes in Swift Creek mortuary complexes over time. Dr. Wallace notes, for example, that burial mounds were places where social relationships were on display. Who brought their dead, who was interred there, and what was buried with them changed over the centuries. Um, Swift Creek mounds were used repeatedly over many, many years and filled with largely domestic ceramic vessels that were carried to the site from near and far. Several hundred years later, later Whedon Island people's uh, burial mounds were erected very quickly over kind of limited internments. That is, not everybody was buried in these mounds by the Whedon Island uh, phase. And they were accompanied by caches of very finely made elaborate effigy vessels. Swift Creek material culture includes very elaborately carved wooden paddles, which were impressed into pottery surfaces. Uh, Dr. Karen Smith and Dr. Jim Knight have proposed that these designs follow a few rules um, for how to delineate the space within the paddle and then rules for how to fill those uh, spaces. Teasing out these designs is challenging work for several reasons. First of all, the potters didn't usually impress the entire design into the surface of the pot. Second, archaeologists usually only find fragments of these vessels with sherds carrying only parts of parts of designs. And then lastly, virtually none of these paddles have survived, um, but the unique impressions and even minor defects in the designs or cracks in the wooden paddles can be traced like fingerprints across river valleys and regions. Tracing the distribution of designs can tell us a story about the movements of pottery and paddles and people. Dr. Karen Smith and her team at the University of South Carolina are currently developing an artificial intelligence program to search for design matches uh, from laser scans of sherds across the Swift Creek area. And they're attempting to do the same kinds of, of matching analyses that Betty Broyles and Dean Snow used to do with tracing paper and their eyeballs. The Mississippi period has long been defined by these seemingly sweeping changes that began with the Big Bang in the bottom or the founding of Cahokia near present day St. Louis. Changes in site layouts after Cahokia included one or more platform mounds constructed uh, adjacent to large rectangular plazas and surrounded by habitation zones filled with new house forms. Pottery traditions changed and began to include shell tempering and new forms and new designs. Iconographic figures shift from naturalistic or anthropomorphic figures to more fantastical mythological figures. Debates have raged for decades about the power of the chiefly elite 
and whether ethnographic models of Polynesian chiefdoms are the right analogs to use to explain the pre-Columbian Southeast. New interpretations consider the Mississippi tradition not so much as a package deal, um, but as a suite of traits or ideas from which local societies could adopt, adapt, or reject elements based on their own preferences and their needs. Another marker of the Mississippi period are changes in subsistence when supposedly the woodland horticultural experiment resulted in a shift to full-blown agriculture uh, and where maize fields supported enormous populations and allowed for surpluses that might be used by the social and political elite. Recent research conducted by Dr. Rachel Briggs considers this shift in diet from a very different and interesting perspective. From the vantage point of the women who had to make this new food source both palatable and they had to figure out how to prepare it. As Dr. Briggs notes, adoption of a new food source is a complicated process, you know, starting with how do you make it? As you might know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, unless corn is prepared properly or supplemented by other foods, consuming a lot of untreated maize can result in a disease of malnutrition called pellagra. Treating corn through nixamalization involves soaking the kernels in an alkaline solution, typically lye, uh, which then makes them easier to grind or, or process, um, and it exposes the endosperm and the germ where the essential amino acids and B vitamins are found. So increasing the digestibility of the kernel is one important part of this preparation process that these Mississippi or Mississippian to be women had to figure out. Relatedly, specialized technology is needed to accomplish this. Maize cooks differently than nut meats like acorns or wall, uh, hickory that were used for millennia across the Southeast. The old woodland vessel forms uh, were perfectly suitable for woodland nut stews, but they would result in inadequately cooked Mississippian maize. Dr. Briggs argues that the standard Mississippian jar, which is sort of a form that appears in the early Mississippian period and then is widely distributed or the idea spreads very quickly. It has a globular form and a wider mouth, which would allow for the cook to maintain even cooking temperatures for the longer period of time that they needed to cook the corn. And it would allow them to add more water as this soupy mixture boiled down um, over the fire. The last step is a vital one for the adoption of any new food source. It has to be considered edible by the people who are going to be served the food. Um, and this is really my favorite part of Dr. Briggs' analysis. She found that many native historic groups preferred hominy with a bitter taste, something that the dish picks up from the wood ash lye that's used in the nixamalization process. And Dr. Briggs suggests that given that the traditionally stewed few, the traditionally stewed foods of the woodland period, uh, which included acorns, which can be bitter, um, but also a lot of greens and roots, which are also bitter, these traditionally stewed foods of the woodland period were bitter, and it's quite likely that boiled, nixtamalized corn um, was able to be adopted by Mississippian families as readily as it was because it tasted like food to them. It was something that they were, or it was a flavor profile that they were accustomed to. So two final notes about the post-Columbian Southeast. The first has to do with the contact period, which has seen a tremendous uptick in the number of uh, studies and reevaluations of our thinking about this really tumultuous time. Southeastern archeologists have come a long way since the early efforts to trace the routes of Spaniards like Hernando de Soto. It was important to get these Spaniards placed on the landscape, but we quick, quickly realized that our impressions, rather their impressions of native Southeasterners um, were not terribly reliable. New histories 
of the immediate impacts of these explorer conquerors and the effects of their diseases and violence uh, have been described in works by Dr. Robbie Etheridge and others. The shatter zone concept um, tries to explain how coastal contacts reverberated far into the interior of the Southeast. Later colonization attempts by the Spanish, the French, and the Johnny-come-lately English continued to pose challenges and threats to which indigenous Southeasterners actively met as allies, as participants, as onlookers, and as opponents. Records from the early 16th century colonial era are filled with the names of native groups that don't persist into the 17th century. Some of these groups were subsumed into larger confederacies with roots in the previous Mississippi period. Others banded together out of necessity and formed new identities. And still others disappeared completely, done in by slave raids or disease or displacement or removal or assimilation. However, the Indians of the native Southeast are not gone and visibility matters. Today, Native American women are killed at a rate that is 10 times the national average. And the protest at Standing Rock throws a bright spotlight on the differential treatment of protesters of pipelines and sovereignty issues, especially when compared with uh, the takeover of federal property in Oregon by the Bundys, or when armed militia members occupy state capitol buildings in Michigan and Kentucky. Sovereignty issues continue to abound for Native Americans. And apart from holding our government accountable for broken agreements and policies that disproportionately harm their communities, an important step in restoring dignity to Native American peoples is recognizing that they never left. So, here endeth the talk. Here's some additional sources if you uh, are interested in following up. And I will uh, stop the show here in a sec and take your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ramey, for that awesome presentation and the review of 14,500 years of history. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, or you can also feel free to, to unmute your mic and ask them in person. Um, if they're, let's see here. I'll start with the ones in the chat while people are getting logged in. Yeah. Um, what type of wood would be used, presumably for those paddles? Um, I don't know if anybody's been able to get a clean enough impression of the clay to make out the grains to be able to tell you maybe if, if it's distinct enough to tell you sort of what species or general type of wood was used. Um, so the answer right now is sort of we don't know, but um, Presumably any wood that could be carved could be turned into one of these paddle designs. Given how long some of them seem to have been used, um, you know, maybe a, a potter's um, output for a decade or so um, is presumably some kind of hard wood, durable wood, um, that we can begin to see cracks in some of these paddles over time. They've traced a few paddles um, and they think they know when it was new, and then after, after a number of uses, it begins to develop hairline cracks, and then they can trace that design because of the cracks or the, the gaps in the design. Um, but all of these are sort of guesses at this point about you know, wood types. Uh, there's another question about whether the Ochuze and the Pensacola were the same quote unquote tribe. Um, and we don't know. And I put tribes in quote because it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a typology. It's a type of pol socio-political organization um, that's hard to define. Um, we tend to call groups tribes without really considering what kind of leadership they had or family structures or, or governmental organizations they had. Um, we've got uh, actually a student on, on this Zoom call who's doing her thesis on this topic right now. Given that there is easily a good 100 years between Spanish accounts that talk about the Ochuze and the Pensacola, um, my assumption is they were not the same group. No. Um, um, my student here, Courtney Boren, her research um, is really shining kind of a bright light on just how many different, different groups of people were in this region 
uh, short between Luna and um, the founding of Pensacola as a colonial city. There were lots of small groups with lots of different names that were sort of billiard balling in and out of this region and who they were um, and whether they were descended from one another and or how they interacted with one another is a really tricky thing to, to tease out. Um, as her thesis work is showing, um, there's a lot of similarity in the material culture. And so groups that historically may have had different names used very similar looking pottery types, for example. And so, you know, pots are not people. We can pick up this pottery type and not really be able to have a clue as to sometimes whether it's pre-Columbian or post-Columbian um, or, or which one of these groups may have used it. Very, very challenging uh, question to try to sort out. Yeah, I might have a question for you if, sure. if there aren't any other ones in your chat box. Um, mm -hmm. I know you talked about the cultural periods in the Southeast more broadly, and you've been doing research in kind of the Northwest Florida area for a few years now. Is there anything you've noticed about this particular area that might be, I guess, unique among other cultures in the Southeast? Um, I think my first response would be, I don't know. <laughs> it's a big um, question. <laughs> I've, it's, it's interesting. I've been here a decade now. Um, I should have it more sorted out than I do. Um, but I think particularly through the work of my, my graduate students, um, I'm learning that this coastal region was much, much more different than the interior than we have assumed. And a lot of those models I was talking about were developed on sites way in the interior. I mean, what we know about Mississippi chiefdoms um, are largely based on interior riverine sites with lots of access to floodplains for farming and maize agriculture and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, frankly, corn does not grow down here, uh, not to the degree that people who relied on it would be able to, to grow. And so um, when we have people here on the coast in that late, late pre-Columbian era, um, they're doing something else economically. You know, they're probably um, fisher people and they're collecting resources and quite possibly just seasonally bringing that stuff back into the, just barely into the interior, maybe up the Conecuh or Escambia rivers. Um, and interacting with more traditional interior groups there. Um, but you know, when we look for big sites around here, we don't find them. We find lots and lots and lots of little sites that are marked by a big heap of oyster shells and um, you know, fish remains and maybe some occasional deer or something like that. But the, you know, they're coming down here for uh, the seafood. You know, Joe Patty's has always been a big draw. As many people continue to do, right? That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, and just as a quick side note, the the painting or illustration that was produced about white sands, I thought the exact same thing when I saw that. Like, why is this woman with her child out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> I was so mad. Walking around in a thunderstorm. <laughs> What's funny is the the that pic, the more I'm reading about this, they found other animal tracks that crossed her tracks, mm. uh, one of which was a sloth. Like I guess some sloth crossed the path and got up on its hind legs, maybe to see where she went and then kept going. And then uh, a mastodon crossed her path, but didn't stop. Like, I don't know where this dire wolves come in. <laughs> and then, and the, the tracks are out and back and it's, it's her and a kid going out and then her solo coming back. And, uh, you know, she's dropping the kid off at the sitter or something. And you know, she's just like, <laughs> having a day to herself and instead they've turned it into this terrible situation <laughs> she makes for a much better by, clickbait that way being pursued by wolves yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a more interesting story maybe than just child rearing <laughs> just passing by a sloth well you know <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I don't know, I don't see any other questions in my chat box here. I don't know if there are any other questions out there. If not, um, we just wanna say thank you again um, to Remy Gujan for joining us today. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And thank you uh, to you all for being here.
we're going to kind of continue with our theme of um, pre-Columbian Florida. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to hear from um, someone about an under, a submerged archaeological site next week on Thursday at 3.30, so don't miss that one. And then we're also going to hear from um, one of Ramey's students, Courtney Boren, um, at the end of the month on Thursday as well. So. Mm -hmm. We have, yeah, we have lots of good talks lined up for the rest of October. November, I'm putting together uh, a fun calendar of um, cemetery-themed uh, presentations as well. So we'll talk about cemeteries as outdoor museums and historic sites. So thank you again to you all. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>